Amen. All right. Malachi chapter 3, I want to focus in on kind of the first part of the chapter there. And just to give you a little ways of introduction, you know, as Christians who are fundamentalists, who believe all the words of the Bible, who believe them literally, who believe that God says what He says, and we make no bones about it. I'm not going to make excuses for what God's Word says. I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it or, or, or make it sound like, well, that's not really what He meant. It's pretty clear. And when the Bible talks about sin, it's very clear. And when the Bible talks about God's grace, it's very clear. Right? We've got good, we've got bad, we've got everything in between. But it is what it is. It's God's Word. Praise the Lord for His Word and who He is. We're not going to change anything about that. But when you take this type of a stand, as, as, as we have and as others I know have, you get a lot of people, and, and, and what's really annoying is, is out of the Christian community. You expect it from the heathen. You expect it from the world. You expect the attacks to come and the persecutions because you're going to stand up and you say, the, the homos are perverted and it should be illegal and we believe that that, that deserves the death penalty because that's what God prescribed in His law as being a righteous judgment for sin, just like adulterers, just like kidnappers, just like rapists. The death penalty, that's what they deserve. We believe in God's righteous judgment. But unfortunately, we have such a watered-down Christianity today that you have Christians coming to you and saying, oh, yeah, but hey, brother, we're, we're in the age of grace. Okay, this is just a time of grace. Where is your grace? Why are you all so hard on sin? And why are you, you know, screaming and yelling about these people and stuff? Look, what I, what I want to preach this morning, what I want to show you is that, first of all, we're not dispensationalists. So we don't believe in all these different seven or nine or 12 or whatever dispensations. We believe, first of all, that people have always been saved by grace through faith. Now, they didn't know the name of Jesus Christ you know, before Christ was on this earth. But, you know, we're going to get into that scripture too. Uh, Romans 4 explains that Abraham was saved by grace. Uh, we see that Abraham was preached the gospel. Moses knew the gospel. These people knew the gospel of Jesus Christ before he even came. That's why they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for the Christ that was going to come and take away the sins of the world. They knew that in the Old Testament. And that's how people got saved. It was by grace. And what we looked here in uh, Malachi chapter 3, look at verse number 6. Verse number 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. God doesn't change. God is the same. He's been the same forever. So when, you know, and again, this is a misconception that people have. So they go, oh, well, the God of the Old Testament is kind of mean and hard on sin and stuff like that. But the God of the New Testament, you know, he's just all love and ever forgiving, everything like that. False. Okay, look, God has always been the same. He's always hated sin. He's always hated wickedness. But he's also always had grace and compassion and love. And what I'm going to show you this morning, a lot of proof from the Old Testament about how God's grace existed in the Old Testament. Because I'm going to set up a few points here to, to get the main, the main point across. But, um, you know, the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. God doesn't change. He doesn't change his mind about what's an abomination, about what's vile. You know, you read these words in the Bible, abomination, vile, wickedness. It, they're pretty severe words. They're pretty extreme words. God doesn't just all of a sudden just flip a switch and be like, oh, we're in the New Testament now. It's really not that bad. Oh, we should just accept that and just allow it in our community and in our society and just be tolerant of it all. No. God is not tolerant of it. We ought not to be tolerant of it. And we need to be fighting against it. And we need to be speaking up with our voices and, and, and you know, preaching against it, rebuking the wickedness so that it doesn't continue to spread. I think the ball has been dropped in churches by and large across the country because, I mean, how could it not have been? Look at the state that we're in today. I'm not going to stand for it. I want my children to be able to grow up in a, in, a, in a surrounding environment where they don't have to be worried about these perverts walking up and down the street and, and these pedophiles trying to, trying to defile them, which is, what, this, which is what the homos are, by the way. They're a bunch of the pedophile perverts. 
Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter number 6. Genesis chapter number 6. We're, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> My first point is, is to show the grace of God in the Old Testament, not, not, not all, the, all, the, all the preaching on the sin and the, and the wickedness. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But this is why, I want to explain why I'm doing this, because people have a tendency to just overemphasize the grace and negate the whole Old Testament and the law and everything else that's good. Um, Jesus Christ himself said he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Okay, he didn't come to just, to just change the law. Now the law was given, Moses' law was given as a covenant, but no one was able to keep that law. That's, you know, that's why they were saved by grace in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. But we're in Genesis chapter 6. I'm going to go to some, some verses and just, just prove to you God's grace existed in the Old Testament as well as it. It's not a brand new thing in the New Testament. Look at chap, uh, verse number 5 of Genesis chapter 6. The Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace. And when think about what is grace. Grace is something that's undeserved. Grace is something that's given to you for free that that's, you didn't merit, you didn't earn, you didn't deserve. It's given. Noah found grace in God's eyes. God gave Noah grace. He spared Noah's life and, and decided to allow him and his family to live because he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And um, what's interesting about this, too, I just wanted to point this out real quick. We're talking about this briefly this morning before church started. In Matthew 24, you know, in, in, in Genesis 6, we see that, you know, God decided to destroy the earth because man was extremely wicked. Man was, was evil and just, just only did evil things continually. And God just like, man, I'm sorry that I even made these people. I wish I hadn't done it. And I'm just going to start over. I'm going to wipe them all out. That was his solution to this problem. But in Matthew chapter 24, Matthew 24 gives us a lot of information about the end times, about what's going to happen, you know, at the, at the rapture and with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Matthew 24 verse 37 says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And this is um, letting us know, you know, the Bible says that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the, when the Son of Man comes. And you think about the wickedness that existed back then, to the point where God was really ready to, to wipe them all off the, the face of the earth. Well, I believe the wickedness is going to be as it was in the days of Noah. And we're starting to see that now with just, with, I mean, everything's out the window. You have divorce rates going through the roof. You've got adultery, fornication, drugs, alcohol, homosexuality, just, just I mean, everything. Before you know it, we're going to start seeing bestiality become an accepted thing. Because... That's what the people, and, and you know, when you look at the Old Testament, we look at these laws, God said, and that's why he wiped those nations out. When he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, and, and, he, and you read about how they went in, and God commanded them, look, destroy all of them. This, is, this wasn't a normal situation for war, which is a lot of people get that wrong too. When God said to, you know, just destroy all of them. Burn it to the ground. You, you, know, you need to destroy the women, the children. Just, just everybody needs to be wiped out. That was God's judgment coming upon those people. Because when he gave the laws, he says, especially in Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, you start reading those, those things that almost turn your stomach just thinking about it. He said, the people of the land did all these things. They did all of them. And that's why God's judgment was brought so harshly against them. And... That's why we need to adhere to these types of laws in our nation today. We, you know, we would be a wise, smart nation if we can follow the laws that God has laid out in the Bible and can just, just stick to that for our, for our um, sense of justice. <clears throat> but if you're, you're in Genesis 6 still, turn to Exodus 34. 
But I believe we're starting to see that as, a, you know, as we're getting closer to the time when Jesus Christ is going to come back. The wickedness is abounding as it was in the days of Noah. Exodus 34. We're, so, we're, see, we're seeing some Old Testament examples of God's grace. And I'm going to try, I'm going to, try to fly through these because um, you can try to keep up if you want. I'm going to, I'm going to be jumping around. I'm going to go to Exodus 34, then Numbers 14, and then Psalm 51 if you want to try to get a little bit ahead. But Exodus 34, verse number 6, the Bible says, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will, will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Remember, God doesn't change. God changes not. We see here, look at how He's exalted. His mercy, gracious, long-suffering, mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity. He's a God of forgiveness. Even in the Old Testament, it's not just a New Testament thing. But also, that will by no means clear the guilty. While He provides grace, while He is long-suffering, while He does forgive, He also is a God of justice. He's the judge. And that hasn't changed in the New Testament. He still is the judge. We're still guilty before God because of our sins, but we need to be washed from those sins in the blood of Jesus Christ so that we don't face the punishment that the judge is going to mete out. It's always been the same. Numbers 14, we're going to see here, Moses then goes back and quotes what, what um, Exodus 34 that we just read, Numbers 14, verse 17 reads, And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children on the third and fourth generation. Exactly what we just read. Look at verse number 19. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according unto the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. Looks like grace to me. Looks like Moses is interceding and going to God and begging God, God, have mercy on this people, Israel. I know they're not really following you the way that they're supposed to be following you, but Lord, you, you're, you're long-suffering, you're, 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 you're merciful, you're gracious. Extend grace unto them. Show mercy on them. And God says, okay, I pardon them. And when God pardons something, he pardons it. It's done. It's over. It's, it's, that's in the past. It's, it's forgiven and forgotten. Extreme grace come in. And if you know what, you know, a lot of the things that the children of Israel were doing wrong, especially when they're wandering around in the wilderness and stuff, look, they did all kinds of things that were, that were bad and evil and wrong. But God gives them grace. God gives them, God pardons their iniquities. Even in the Old Testament, Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Oh, good. <clears throat> Psalm 51, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Sounds a lot like the salvation we receive today, being washed through the blood of Christ. We see David here coming to God and confessing that he's a sinner and asking for God's mercy. 
And that's essentially what we do today. Salvation has been the same way. And I'm not going to prove about the salvation. I've done that in other sermons. But um, it's pretty clear. We could see that in Psalm 51. And he's going to God, and God's showing grace. Psalm, you could turn to Psalm 86. Psalm 86, verse 5 says, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. And then verse 13, Psalm 86, verse 13 reads, for great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul and have not set thee before them. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. God's mercy, and even, and we're not going to turn there, but in Psalm 136, Every single verse ends with, for his mercy endureth forever. For his mercy endureth for you. Read the entire Psalm 136. Every single verse, for his mercy endureth forever. This is a God of mercy that we see in the Old Testament. This is a God of forgiveness, of grace. God doesn't change. Now, turn if you would to Psalm 145. Psalm 145. This is the last place I, I think I've, I've shown, you know, shown the point pretty well from the Old Testament about God's grace and His mercy. We're going to see one last passage. And you know what? There are lots, lots more. I was just kind of picking and choosing which ones I wanted to go to this morning just to prove this point. But I want to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. The Old Testament was also a time of grace. It's not just the New Testament. And people will call this the age of grace. And they, you know, people have different meanings for why they say that, whatever. But... God's grace has existed all throughout time, okay? And I'm just proving all these places in the Old Testament that show God's grace, His mercy, His long-suffering. Psalm 145, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. And His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Full of grace. But jump down to verse 17, because remember, and keep this in mind, God doesn't change. It's great to look at how gracious and merciful and everything is and, and David exalting that in this psalm. But look at, just jump down to verse 17 and keep in mind, God doesn't change. The Lord is righteous, in, uh, verse number 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him. But look at this. But all the wicked will he destroy. God is a God of great love, of great grace, of great mercy. But he's also a God of justice and of righteousness. And, and he will judge the wicked and he's going to destroy them. The Bible says the Lord's angry with the wicked every day. Okay. We have to have the full understanding, the complete picture. It's not all one or the other. It's not all bad. It's not all good. God is love, yes, but God is also wrath. God has both, and we need to understand as his children who he is, who he really is, and not get an imbalanced view of who God is. Turn if you would to... Um, Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter number 2 in the New Testament. Galatians chapter number 2. Now, I will, I will tell you this. That grace is probably talked about a lot more in the New Testament than it is in the Old Testament. Just in general. It's, it's referred to a lot more because... That's when Jesus came and Jesus brought grace unto us. Now, people were always looking ahead for that Messiah in the Old Testament. 
But when he actually came, you know, there's, you're going to find grace mentioned a lot more in the New Testament. And, and I have no problems with that either, but I'm just, you know, we don't want to get, again, the wrong impression of just saying, well, that's all God's about now in the New Testament, and he's just completely gotten rid of the law, because that hasn't happened. John 1.17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, Obviously, the law is in the Old Testament, but that doesn't, just because the law was given by Moses doesn't mean the whole Old Testament is not about grace, right? We need the law because the law is given as a, school, a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. The law is given there to show us that we are sinners, to show us that we need a Savior. That's why the law was given. Now, nobody was able to get saved by the law of Moses because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody's a sinner. That's why we needed the grace and truth that did come by Jesus Christ. And um, in Galatians 2, look at verse 21. The Bible says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So he's saying, look, I'm not going to frustrate, I'm not going to confound the grace of God. Because God's grace is something that's given. It's something, like we mentioned earlier, it's, it's, it's given for free, it's undeserved. If righteousness came by doing good works and being a good person and obeying God's law, he says, then Christ is dead for nothing, in vain. Christ would have no reason to come and die on the cross and bear the sins of the whole world if we can just be justified by obeying the law of Moses, by obeying the law of God. If we can just follow all those laws, because if you can do that, then Christ wouldn't need to die. But he did need to die in order to pay and be the propitiation for our sins. But when, you, when, you, and when people start to say, well, you need to believe on Christ. So the Bible says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's grace. That's a free gift. That's something that's undeserved, that all you do to receive that gift is put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved. But see, people try to frustrate that grace when they start adding in the works. And they start saying, well, believing isn't enough. I know the Bible says, for whosoever believeth in him, should not be ashamed. Whosoever believeth in him shall have everlasting life. You know, it says that, but that's not enough. You still need to do good works. You need to obey the law. You need to do all these other things. That's frustrating the grace of God. Because when you start adding in obedience to the law, that's works. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And when you start saying you have to obey the law and you have to believe in Christ, you've just frustrated the grace of God. You've, you've added works, which all of a sudden now, instead of being free, instead of being grace, it's something that, is, that you've earned and is merited by you. And that is not what salvation is. That's not what grace is. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 4. As this is why I was, I was getting ahead of myself earlier when I brought this up. But this is a great scripture to prove that people were never saved by obeying the law. One of many. This is one of my favorite chapters to go to. And to say that we're in the age of grace only in the New Testament is incorrect because there's always been an age of grace. People have always been saved by grace through faith. Romans chapter 4, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, this is Old Testament, talking about Abraham, way Old Testament, book of Genesis. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What was counted unto him? His belief, his faith in God was counted unto him for righteousness. Verse number four, now to him that worketh, so him that's doing good works, him that's, that, that's following and obeying the law, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. That means it's owed to you. So if you're working, like when I go to, to go to my job and I go to work, my boss owes me the money that I've worked for because it's, 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 he's indebted to me now. He has to pay me what I've done for him. That's how that transaction works, but that's not grace. He doesn't say, you know, at the end of the week, hey Dave, here's, here's a gift for you just because I love you and I want you to be happy. Here you go. <laughs> no, I earned that money. Now, I, you know, it'd be great if you did something like that in addition to what I've earned, but hey, that, you know, that's, that, those are two separate things. So like a, a, around Christmas time, they oftentimes give a bonus, right? 
That's grace. That's not deserved. That's not, that's not given to us because I've worked for it or earned or anything like that. It's because, hey, you know what? It's Christmas time. We want you guys to be happy. Here's some money. Merry Christmas. Go, go buy something for your family. That's grace. But, the, but I still get my regular paycheck that I earned that week. And this is what this is explaining here in Romans 4, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Verse number 5, but to him that worketh not, someone doing no works, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also, that was talking about Abraham. Now we're going to see David, right? Abraham, you say, oh, well, that was before the law of Moses. And it was. He was before the law, before Moses laid out the law. Okay, what about David? Because David came after Moses. David was living in the time of Mosaic law. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Now, if you were saved in the Old Testament by obeying God's law, then how can you receive righteousness without works? It's impossible. By obeying the laws is by working. That's what you're doing. Verse number seven, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Grace. Now, this is a New Testament reference, but talking about people in the Old Testament, talking about Abraham, talking about David, experiencing God's saving grace in the Old Testament. Jump down to verse number 16. Romans 4, 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Flip over to Romans chapter 5. You're in Romans 4. The Bible says, moreover, in verse 20, Romans 5 verse 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, and this is kind of an attitude that people will take these days in the watered down Christianity saying that, oh, well, we're in the age of grace. So, you know, basically everything's fine. Hey, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And people will kind of just, just say that, well, it's not that big of a deal. Hey, man, I'm free in Christ. I can, do, I can do all things. It doesn't matter. And no, it does matter. And this is what we need to understand, too. Look, God, when you're saved, you're born again. You become a child of God. You become God's son. And God becomes your father when you are born again. And if we could just keep this straight in our minds, we would do a lot better. At least those, of us, those people that think that, Sin doesn't really matter. That why are you judging people? Why are you, you know, preaching against this sin or that sin? Look, God still has the same rules. God has the same laws. And it's the same. Think about it this way. You know, I've got three little girls. I've got rules for them to follow as their father. Are these rules designed because I hate them? Because I'm just waiting for them to break a rule and then boom! <laughs> That's the whole purpose. It's just for my entertainment. No. No. The rules are there for their benefit because I want them to grow up right. I want them to learn how to be nice, Christian, modest young ladies that are going to be a good example, a godly example for other people. But they need to learn right from wrong. They need, they need to learn that as they're growing older. They can't just be left to themselves or they're turning into monsters. They need to, to be disciplined and, and shown that this is right, this is wrong. It's all for their benefits, all because I love them. God has the same thing for us as his children. He's got rules for us to follow. And, he's, and, and it's for our benefit. It's not because he's mean. He's like, oh, I don't want you guys to have any fun in this life, you know, as if, you know, people think that as if the only fun is going out and getting drunk and passing out and, you know, like that's fun. If that's your idea of fun, you, you, you're, you have no idea what fun is. No idea. God does not give us rules to, to, to hinder us. It's to help us. But as a father, as a loving father, if we decide to just disregard God, disregard what he said unto us, he's going to come down hard on us. You better believe that. When my, if my daughter just defy me and say, you know what, I need you to go clean your room. And they're just like, no, I don't feel like it. I don't want to go do that. Guess what's going to happen? 
It's not going to be pretty. There's going to be some crying involved, a lot of it, and a red behind. And then they're still going to go and clean the room. Okay? When we decide to take God's laws and just, no. You know what? I like drinking my alcohol. I like doing it. I, whatever the sin. It doesn't matter what it is. When you, when you can see something clearly in the Bible and God's saying don't do this and you just say, you know what? I'm just going to go and do it anyways. God's going to come down hard on you because he loves you, because he wants you to do what's right, because these sins are going to destroy your life. He knows what's best for you and he's trying to get you to avoid that. And the preaching on the sin needs to be there because we need to not just get such a relaxed attitude that we think that, no, oh, it's really not that bad. It is that bad. It is, it is that bad. And it's, it's as bad. You know what it's bad as? It's as bad as the Bible says it is. I'm not going to trump it up and play it up to be more than that, but I'm definitely not going to make it sound like it's any less than it really is. And in the Bible... Every sin is worthy of hell. Every sin is worthy of hellfire. Think about that for a while. That's serious. So it's kind of hard to, to play up any more than that how serious our, sin, our, our sins are in God's eyes. But thank God for His grace and His mercy because even though we deserve those punishments, God has, has shown and exhibited His grace through Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us to save us from those sins. Look at Romans chapter 6, so in verse number 1, because we saw in Romans 5 at the end there how, you know, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. So people tend to have an attitude of thinking like, well, I mean, God's grace covers me for everything. And it's true, it does. But does that mean you should just, just be ignorant of sin and just go out and just do whatever and not care? No, of course not. Look at verse number 1 of Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer there? And he's saying, look, just because if you sin more, grace will abound and cover that because Christ's blood covers all of our sins, does that mean we should just go out and just say, hey, well, it doesn't matter now, I'm just going to go ahead and sin? No, of course not. God forbid that you should think like that or do that. And that's not what we preach at all, that, you should, that, that one should go out and do those things. And think about what even is sin. For these people who want to say, well, you know, the law is just, just doesn't exist anymore because Christ has abolished the law. This is what people say. Well then, why is Romans 6 talking about us not sinning? 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Okay? The Bible is defining sin as transgressing God's law. So if the law doesn't exist because you're free in Christ, then how can sin even exist? Because that's what, that's what sin is. You're transgressing God's law, right? How can that even exist? So then why it wouldn't even make any sense in Romans 6 for them to be saying, shall we continue in sin? Well, if there's no law, if you're, you know, because, because Christ abolished the law, then, then there wouldn't even be such a thing as sin because sin is the transgression of the law. It's foolishness. It's foolishness to think that just because Christ came that the law doesn't matter anymore. Because it does matter. Now, it, it's never been a way for us to get saved, but we're not talking about salvation now. We're talking about just doing what's right and obeying God's law. Just the same way my children don't have to do anything to be my children. Once they're born into my family, they're my children forever. Once we're born again, we're in God's family forever. But just as I have rules for them, God has rules for us. And it doesn't, just because Christ came and did that, just because you're born into his family doesn't mean there are no rules for you. No, of course there's rules for you. You're still in Romans 6. Jump down to verse number 4. Verse number 4 says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Look, we, you know, and, and this goes on further from the, from the first verse saying, shall we continue in sin? No, God forbid. No, we need to be dead to that sin. We need to walk in newness of life. 
We have that new spirit now. We can please God. We need to be following after the righteous way and be dead to that old sins and, and that old man that's crucified with Christ. We need to leave that there and, and, and walk in newness of life. Look at verse number 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace. God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And this is, you know, people like to take one verse out of context and try to run with it and make whole doctrines out of it. But after we read, you know, Romans 6, almost the entire chapter in the context here, we see, and, and also Romans 4 and Romans 5, Romans 6, you know, we see all these things pasted together. You can't just pull one thing out and say, um, where was it? We just read it. What, uh, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And people will take that. Well, we're not under the law, we're under grace. We're not under the law, we're under grace. So the law doesn't really matter to us anymore. And they just kind of run with that. And he's saying, no, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about we're not under the law in the sense that we're not under the curse of the law of our sins being, being dealt with with the punishment of hell because God has forgiven all of our sins. So we're not under the law in that regard. We're under the grace of God. But that doesn't mean that we should just sin or that the law doesn't matter. Because if the law didn't even matter anymore at all, like just in, in, in no regard, then why would he even worry about us sinning? Because we're not under the law. It doesn't make any sense. It, it wouldn't make any sense that way. He says, God forbid. And one of the reasons why is because to whom, he says in verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. You can still, just because you're saved doesn't mean you can't get into sin. If you get into sin, you know, that is good. You're going to be a servant of sin. You're going to be in bondage still to that sin. And it's going to ruin your life. And it's going to destroy your life. Now, thankfully, if you're saved, you know, you're, you've got a home in heaven. But your existence in this life is going to be miserable. You're going to be continually getting chastened and chastised by the Lord, by your loving Father. And you know, you're going to be in bondage unto various sins, whatever they may be. But if you can die to those sins and do what's right, then you won't be in that bondage. You'll be servants of the living God and God will bless you and, and you will have a much, much better existence here and earn yourself rewards in the afterlife. So don't let people, you know, first of all, don't let people try to steer you wrong, you know, try to, to back you down when you take a hard stand against sin. We need to take the hard stand against sin. Now more than ever. People need to hear the rebuking. People need to hear the truth about, about these various sins and how bad they really are. And, you know, I just, I just recently had someone, uh, another independent fundamental Baptist, not just, not, not some, you know, necessarily a phony Christian, but I mean, another independent fundamental Baptist Rebuke, trying to rebuke me for my stance on homosexuality, saying, "Well, where's your grace?" And <laughs> first of all, you know, th this guy found one little clip of a video on on the internet, and it was like a few minutes long or something. And people see something like that, and then all of a sudden they just think like, "That's all you ever talk about. That's all you are, 24/7. You're just railing on this one subject." It's like, no, you you, you saw one little peace about me. It's like, I preach on grace a lot. I preach on the love of God a lot. I preach on everything in the Bible. But I'm not going to back down on any of these things either. And, you know, we're going back and forth 
because I found this ridiculous. I'm like, this is ex you are exactly the person that needs to hear this message. Because you are what's failing our country and our churches and you're, you're, you're having a soft spot for these sins because all of a sudden now it's not politically correct. Because the world's going to come down on you or you might have other friends in the world that are going to say, oh, now, you know, now if you say anything against the homos, well, you're a hater and you're a bigot and you're like a racist and you're all these, you get all these different labels. And I say, bring it on. Go ahead and label me whatever the heck you want because I've got the truth. The Bible doesn't lie. The Bible does not take a soft stand on these sins, especially on homosexuality, which I don't care if the world accepts it, embraces it. I don't care if I'm the only one left that believes this way. Because this is what God, and I know I'm not the only one left. There's lots of people that believe the exact same way. Unfortunately, though, a lot of people that believe the same way don't really speak up when they ought to. And you become silent and you let the big mouth bullies and their liberal propaganda make a really loud voice so that it influences people to thinking that they're a lot bigger than they are. That there's a lot more of them than there actually are. Because the good people aren't standing up and, and, and you know, speaking their voices against that. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I pray to you, please strengthen us all. To, um, to stand up against the bullies, dear Lord. And don't let people try to twist this, twist this idea of, of this age of grace around. God, we know that you don't change. We know that if you felt a certain way about a sin in the past, you feel the same way about those sins today. We love you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your long-suffering, dear Lord. Truly, that's obviously the only way that we could even ever attain salvation is through your grace and through your mercy. But we can't use it as an excuse to, to not stand up against what's, against what's wrong, stand and fight against these, these wicked sins that are going to destroy our country and, and just destroy people's lives in general, dear Lord. The more tolerant and, and open we are of these, of these sins, Lord, it's, it's just going to ruin us. It's going to ruin our society, we'll ruin our culture, and ultimately, if it gets bad enough, it's going to bring judgment to work completely destroyed as you've done time and time and time again in the past dear lord help us not to to be doomed to repeating this fate in this country dear lord help us to be able to those of us who who still believe that your word is true help us to stand for the truth dear lord and not be backed down it's in jesus name we pray amen